Good day, Kavibal, and welcome to our Learn at Home Facebook Live session. For the discussion today, the topic will be on Genes at Work, the Mysteries of D DNA Intelligence. Before we begin, take note of the following reminders. Make sure you are registered to the webinar to have your e-certificate of participation. Visit certificate.vibalgroup.com to generate your proof of attendance. Share the video using hashtag LearnAs1PH as our official hashtag to our Vibal webinars. Experience learning, Kavibal. And now, to proceed with our webinar this evening, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our distinguished speaker today. Ms. Lorraine Joyce M. Del Rosario is a former teacher at the University of Santo Tomas Senior High School and instructor at the University of Santo Tomas. She has taught fields of science and practical research. With a background in journalism and communication, particip participating in regional and national conferences in the field of writing and radio broadcasting, she, uh, she has also been appointed in many other scholarly pursuits as the moderator of La Stampa, the official publication of the UST Senior High School, and as an e-learning specialist and educational technology coordinator. She was also an active member of the UST Senior High School Executive Committee and many other work and academic related societies and organizations. Apart from consistently topping her class and graduating as valedictorian in special program in journalism of her public high school, Ms. Del Rosario earned a, a BS Biology degree from the University of the Philippines, Baguio in 2017, supported by a DOST scholarship. Her undergraduate thesis on the potential of bioluminescent bacteria as biosensors of heavy metals, studied with her thesis partner, was awarded as one of the two best paper presentation in the Third Philippines Solid and Hazardous Waste Management Conference. She is currently pursuing her Master of Science degree in Biology at UP Diliman, granted with another DST scholarship. Thus, she is now full-time in the graduate school for her MS thesis. Her current field of interest is in genetics, particularly in the study of DNA in molecular phylogenetics. In the previous years, she has reviewed about the role of ancient DNA in the identification of remains, which enabled her to present a poster and be a rapporteur in the fifth forensic science symposium in the Philippines. Aside from being an educator and a graduate student, Ms. Del Rosario spends her time writing, tutoring English to Japanese students online, and accepting, speaking, and hosting engagements. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Ms. Lorraine Joyce M. Del Rosario. Thank you very much, Mel, for, for that introduction. I hope everyone can already see my slides. Okay. In the first set of slides, uh, I will be showing images of people who are very sure, very familiar with all of you. So, of course, who wouldn't know about Sir Albert Einstein or Sir Isaac Newton? So yeah, for the purpose of our discussion, I have chosen renowned people whom at an instant you will easily recognize. Or if you ever you're not familiar, then uh, let me also introduce to you this uh, Sheldon Cooper. And putting them side by side to one another, I'm sure you already have some thoughts on what characteristic is common among them. So it seems like a cliche, but what is common among them? Why do we instantly associate them with such term? And what is it that society really taught us about being intelligent? So all of these are interesting questions searing in our mind when we think about intelligence. Perhaps they have big brain, or maybe they came from brainy families, or perhaps it is inborn, or because it's measured by science. So join me today, or tonight rather. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Lorraine Joyce Del Rosario, and I'm beyond grateful and honored to join you in this short journey as we unravel genes at work, 
the mysteries of DNA intelligence laid out in this 30-minute presentation. I would like to personally thank Vival Group for providing us a platform tonight in sharing knowledge about knowledge or intelligence. So sit back, relax, and learn with me. So this is the object, these are the objectives of our presentation for tonight. So basically we're going to explore myths, mysteries, and scientific concepts about intelligence. Explain the role or appreciate and appreciate the role of genetics, epigenetics, or how behavior affects our genes and the neurosciences. Um, we'll also develop some educational strategies in, in, uh, as intelligence is influenced by the environment. And we'll justify later that learning can be enhanced or alternatively diminish. And we're going to also finally explore some ways on how we can adapt in this ever-changing world as we maximize our thinking and learning abilities to increase our potential. And this will be, this is the outline of my presentation. To provide a background, of course, a foundation, let's define this term, which we have been talking about since a while ago in the introduction. Intelligence, it's a very broad term, and it's really challenging to study, in part because it can be defined and measured in different ways, most definitions of intelligence include the ability to learn from experiences or adapt to changing environments, but other elements also include the ability to reason, plan, solve problems, think abstractly, and understand complex ideas. Intelligence, more precisely as gen general cognitive ability, or G, as discovered and defined by Spearman in 1904, indexes the covariance which accounts for about 40% of the total variance when a battery of diverse cognitive tests is administered to a sample with a good range of cognitive ability. And mind you, intelligence is one of the best predictors of important life outcomes such as education, occupation, and mental and physical health and illness, and even mortality. So without further ado, let's begin with our first topic in the outline, which is on unraveling mysteries and debunking some myths about DNA intelligence. Until the past few years, the best science available would have been hard-pressed to reliably identify a snippet of DNA associated with something as complex as human intelligence. Today, thanks to recent advances, for the cost of maybe just around one year Netflix subscription, you can spit into a tube, send it off to a laboratory, and have your DNA sequence to learn about your ancestry and get a number known as polygenic score that give you rough odds of having high or low intelligence. Although this has alarmed many skeptics, as it may have been littered with errors, and that this newfound ability to look into person's genome for markers of intelligence may threaten instead of promise a bright future. And we all know, perhaps we grew into a society with norms that have stuck with us through the generations. Although as time progresses, new and updated ideas are also conceived. So let's begin with our mystery number one. Intelligence is just about genetics. We'll find out. Intelligence may be written in our genes, but in a language, we don't yet know how to read. Genetics is part of the mix, but only a part. Much of the literature concludes that heredity, fa hereditary factors play a minor role at best in the determination of intelligence. So just a quick review in our science, more than 60 years ago, books have introduced Francis Crick and James Watson. Though in reality, let me shed off that it's really Rosalind Franklin, the unsung hero who discovered the double helical structure of DNA. And these are packaged in, as chromosomes in our nucleus. And genes are the short segments of DNA that code for specific molecules with functions, such as amino acids that are building blocks of protein. The transmission of genes to an organism's offspring is the basis of the inheritance of traits. And heritability is the extent to which intelligence 
test score variation can be attributed to genetic variation. Yet while it is an irrefutable fact that the transmission of DNA from parents to offspring is a biological basis for heredity, we still know relatively little about the specific genes that are involved in intelligence. So to know more about the heritability of intelligence, it can be done through GWAS studies or genome-wide association studies. Polygenic scores search for differences in people's genetic makeup, which are their genotypes, that correlate with the differences in their observable traits, which are their phenotypes. And in a GWAS published in Nature Genetics, a team of scientists from around the world analyzed the DNA sequences of 78,308 people for correlations with general intelligence, as measured by IQ tests. And the major goal of that study was to identify single nucleotide polymorphisms, or also known as SNPs, that correlate significantly with intelligence test scores. So a SNP is a nucleotide at a particular chromosomal region that can differ across individuals. And from there on, the researchers analyzed intelligence test scores and the complete genomes of all those people mentioned and studied about. So scientists can use the we their wealth of data to find the specific arrangements of molecules that code for differences in the brain. And of the more than 12 million SNPs analyzed, 336 correlated significantly with intelligence, implicating 22 different genes. So there you have it. 22 genes implicated in intelligence made sense because they were genes previously shown to be involved in regulating the growth of neurons or associated with intellectual disability and cerebral malformation. So together, the SNPs accounted for about 5% of the differences across people in intelligence and examining larger patterns of SNPs, the researchers discovered these genes of intelligence. However, is it really only the genes? How are we going to find out? Well, in genetics, it is also common to have twin and adoption studies. Well, intelligence cannot be solely attributed to genetics. And this is best exhibited in twin and adoption studies. Uh, identical twins and fraternal twins, they are studied in genetics. So just to give you a background, identical twins, these are kinds of twins that, which develop from one fertilized egg and may or may not share one amniotic sac. On the other hand, we have fraternal twins. Although fraternal twins develop from two fertilized egg each with amniotic sac. So it was found out in twin studies that intelligence test scores of identical twins raised together are similar as the same person taking the test twice. And for adoption studies, adoption studies and fraternal twin studies also show that environment and the way in which these children are raised can have an impact on intelligence. So uh, the photos here show the brain scan. Brain scan show identical twins are built and they function similarly. Some genes have also been identified, but intelligence involves many genes and combinations. And we also have um, the graph here, which shows similarity of intelligence scores in terms of correlation, revealing that both genetics and the environment influence intelligence. So in this case, researchers revealed a very high correlation in the test scores for identical twins who were raised together in the same home. When identical twins were raised apart from each other, their test scores correlated highly as well, but not as highly as the scores of identical twins who grew up in the same home. And when fraternal twins were raised together also, they had a high correlation test, however, not, uh, but the scores are less than those of the identical twins thus displaying the genetic effects on intelligence. And at the lowest end of the intelligence test score correlation scale were the siblings um, raised together and the siblings raised apart. So altogether, the study revealed that both genetics and the environment influence intelligence. And further on, on the adoptive studies or adoption studies, 
adoption enhances IQ scores of neglected children. And when environment is varied, environment is more predictive of the score. So for adoptive children, resem uh, they resemble biological parents in terms of their thinking, feeling, and acting. However, they resemble adoptive parents in values, attitude, faith, and politics. So it's really not just in the genes. And there's also another study. There are other factors also. Um, another thing is hard work or the drudge theory of genius. Others suggested that attitude matters as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a study of young musicians and it, they, it was found out that it was not the number of practice hour that these students racked up that determined their success, but rather their long-term commitment. So in other words, intelligent people requires a certain mindset at an unflappable persistence. So that's for our mystery number one. Mystery number two, intelligent people have bigger brains. So it's a question to ask. Although in reality, there are studies proving this. Brains, you know, just as pickpockets anticipate what an object is by touching it, the human brain anticipates what an object is in a shop's window display will feel like just by looking at it. So this is a photo of a healthy brain, you know, with, with the cerebrum made of the lobes that control reading, thinking, learning, speech, emotions, and um, plan muscle movements like walking. And then we have the cerebellum, which controls balance and coordination, and the brainstem, which controls fundamental body functions. So in the study by Koch in 2016, in healthy volunteers, Total brain volume weakly correlates with intelligence with a correlation value between 0.3 and 0.4 out of a possible 1.0. So in other words, there is a really a study proving that brain size accounts for between 9 and 16% of the overall variability in general intelligence. In the next slide, um, this, if you can see here, these are the areas that represent or these are the colored ones here represent the areas of the brains which are associated with intelligence. So brain areas with significant association between the cortical thickness and the general intelligence in different studies. Uh, cortical thickness are the ones related with the gray matter thickness, which is related to learning and intelligence. So basically, bigger brain volume proven by many studies, it, it can also be correlated also with higher intelligence. So the reading hypothesis of the past century um, is also evident until now. And this has also been proved by many neuroimaging techniques. Yeah, although brain formation and functioning are based on a genetic substrate that influence it to a moderate or high degree, the brain is also malleable and it's affected by education and daily experiences. And therefore, so too are the cognitive function. So these are also other models of intelligence associated with the brain. And it has something to do with the brain waves, the network neuroscience theory, and plasticity. So that's for our mystery number two. And uh, next, mystery number three. Are intelligent people more lonely? Intelligent people, are they really grumpy loners? Are there studies proving this? So actually, science was able to explain why intelligent people prefer to be alone. They found that highly intelligent people feel they don't benefit as much from friendships and yet socialize more often than less intelligent people. So highly intelligent people, therefore, use solitude as a way to reset themselves after socializing in highly stressful urban environments. So according to the study of Ivanov in 2019, intelligent people are more closed in themselves and they are self-absorbed in solving some problems. So they tend to have less friends than the average person. And according to yeah, Nikola Tesla, the smarter you are, the more selective you become. So perhaps this also explains why if you are familiar with David Hume, the Scottish philosopher, he would spend weeks holed up in his study, reading and pondering. But then he would emerge and head straight to the local pub, absolutely unnecessarily deemed 
determined to live and talk and act like other people in the common affairs of life. Conversely, Beethoven, you know, our music genius, he would also regularly escape bustling Vienna, Austria for long solitary walks in the Verdant's Wienerwald. And that is where he finds some musical inspiration. So that's for our third mystery. And our mystery number four, intelligent people can pop up anywhere. It's a question. So can we think of intelligent people as intellectual equivalents of shooting stars? Beautiful to behold, but essentially random? Well, actually, the density and intimacy of an urban setting nurture, or any, any setting, nurture creativity intelligence. And as Plato said, what is honored in a country will be cultivated there. Hence, it's rightful to know that intelligent people are less like shooting stars and more like flowers, a natural outcome of creative ecology. And lastly, for our last mystery, people now are more intelligent than ever. So I think this is like a question of competition. Well, college attendance rates, IQ scores, many people believe that it's higher at present than ever, leading many to conclude that we're living in the golden age of genius. But don't bet on it. Admittedly, comparing creative output across the centuries is really tricky because we need the perspective of time. People of every era believe that theirs is golden, and we are no exception. So sure, we've seen tremendous advances in digital technology now and the emergence of many possible geniuses, but the jury is out on our goldenness. And in the science, momentous leaps have always been replaced by in impressive but incremental advances. So yeah, people of every era believe that theirs is golden and even us current generation, we are no exception to it. So those are some, some of the mysteries of intelligence. Now let's proceed with the true nature of DNA intelligence. Intuitively, we all know that what it is to be intelligent, although definitions of intelligence as mentioned can be very diverse. So it is something that helps us plan, reason, solve problems, quickly learn, make decisions, etc. Now to capture this elusive trait, cognitive tests have been designed to measure performance in different cognitive domains, such as processing speed and language. So I'm sure we're familiar with different quotients, right? Or the, as they call, aptitude of success, like EQ, IQ, SQ, right? And there's a strange phenomenon, we call it the Plin effect, it's attributed to environmental influences. Therefore, environment really has a role to play in intelligence. And it cannot be due to heredity, heredity because the world's gene pool could not have been changed in the 70 years since IQ testing. Uh, we also have what we call fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. So fluid intelligence involves being able to think and reason abstractly and solve problems. Whereas crystallized intelligence is based upon facts and rooted in experiences. Another forms of intelligence. So uh, if you're familiar with this robot, this is Sophia, the very first robot granted with the citizenship in the world. She is a product of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence, that's another issue to ponder in the field of um, behavioral genetics. Artificial intelligence is the study and design of intelligent agent with the ability to analyze environments and produce actions which maximize success. As compared to human intelligence, human intelligence is the quality of the mind that is made up of capabilities to learn, adapt, handle abstract ideas, and change environment using knowledge gain. So it will be a long withstanding debate whether which is you know, becoming more superior human intelligence, artificial intelligence, machine versus man, okay? And uh, without further ado, let's proceed with our third uh, topic. The, now the, we'll, we'll, del, uh, we'll deal with the environmental role in intelligence. So as mentioned during the course of the presentation, intelligence is not solely the product of DNA and no scientist studying it thinks otherwise. Environment will always have a major impact on the development of intelligence or any other psychological trait, trait. And all the same, knowledge gained from molecular genetic research may one day 
be used to identify children at risk for developing serious cognitive deficits and those for whom certain types of early interventions may reduce that risk. So environment can also play a big role in enhancing or alternatively diminishing intelligence. Well, in reality, it depends on how you will enable yourself to be affected and how you will be able to use the acquired intelligence from the environment. So these are the evidences for environmental influence. So a while ago, we have already tackled twin studies and adoption studies. So there are also other ev evidences for environmental influence, such as number three is nutrition. What and how regularly children are fed are aspects of environment that have long-term effects on intellectual development. Um, there was a study, malnourished pregnant women, they tend to have babies or fetuses with smaller brains in, uh, smaller brains in size. Another thing that is an evidence for environmental influence is home environment. Home environment affects intellectual development from the variety of stimulation and experiences to which the children are exposed. The extent to which parents interact and play with their children, the amount and complexity of verbal communication, the extent to which toys, puzzles, and books are available and appropriate for the age of the children, it has an effect on intelligence. Um, the importance of school is in nurturing intelligence is also highlighted here. So early intervention and effects of schooling. When students must start school later than they would otherwise for reasons beyond their family's control, their IQs are, you know, about five points lower, according to some studies. Schooling does enhance later income. And, you know, in school, in college, in high school, study motivation and skills are as good as previous grades to determine academic achievement. And with motivation also, when promised something for doing well, you know, these students tend to score higher on tests. So motivations are important as well. So genes make a difference, but life experiences do too. And then finally, um, some adaptive strategies to maximize our potential, especially in this ever-changing world. Um, we are faced with many challenges every day, with many obstacles, but our brains be having the characteristic of being plastic, plasticity, neural plasticity, it's also forming new connections and forming adaptive strategies to maximize our potentials in this world. And these are also five primary principles which are helpful in increasing our intelligence or maximizing our potentials. First is, let's continue to seek novelty in what we do. Uh, let's always challenge ourselves, you know, go beyond the box. Um, and then, because we will never know what awaits us, right, if we do not try and if we do not go beyond our limit. Let's also strive to think creatively. Do things the hard way. Uh, yeah, that could that that will enable you to discover more of what you can do. And of course, network. How do we enhance network when we share our knowledge or when we also receive knowledge from others? And about polygenic scores, tests, right? DNA tests, are they really useful predictors of individual intelligence? Well, as for polygenic scores, still just because they aren't, they aren't very useful predictors of individual intelligence. But it doesn't mean that they can't be useful at all. They can be useful for us educators. And one of the most promising uses for polygenic scores is to study the environmental factors. And there are a lot of studies are also saying that the importance of or the crucial role of education. Right? The most recent genetic and epigenetic data we have available to us emphasize the crucial roles that education, professionals, families, and society play when contributing to the education of people who can and want to make the most out of their capabilities. Just like now, the pandemic will not, not stop us from learning wherever we are, learning remotely, learning at home. That's why Vibal Group is also our partner here in our Learn at Home experience. It's the new now of learning experience. And it's nice because, you know, nothing is impossible, even at the comfort of our very homes. Education never stops. So these Learn at Home kits, webinars such as this, these are, yeah, 
it's a really a good opportunity, a great opportunity for us to widen our um, scope, widen our knowledge, learn something new, learn uh, or review concepts that we have already learned before. And so with that, uh, that is our, my talk on or my, my presentation. Let's just have some conclusion and key takeaways. The brain can continue learning new skills and concepts throughout life while also dynamically interacting with the environment. Improved by, of course, adaptive strategy. So what will, where will this lead? This paves way to understanding the goal of education in this ever-changing world, which is to form adaptable and versatile people like you and me and anyone who can make the most out of our capabilities. And just a final take home message. So learning about intelligence is still complicated. There's so much to learn. 30 minutes, our 30 minutes is not enough. But one thing is for sure. Let's continue learning and sharing knowledge. It is one thing which is non-taxable and which we don't have to lose anything when we give. When we share our knowledge, it spreads and blossoms even more. So remember, the brain is like any other muscle. It grows stronger as neuron connections grow. Thank you very much for listening. And here are my references. Thank you, and I wish everyone a, uh, a good evening. And thank you very much to Vibal Group for this uh, platform in sharing knowledge and reaching out to you know millions of filipinos millions of people are out there thank you very much ma'am do you have any last reminders to our viewers for today um i i believe ma'am i have also i have mentioned the key takeaways from the presentation just just keep on learning and sharing knowledge thank you po there we have it. In behalf of Vibal Group Incorporated, I would like to thank our speaker for today for this very insightful learning session. It is an honor to have you with us today, ma'am. And to all our Vibal viewers, all thanks to you for your continuous patronage to our daily learning session. Don't forget to register to get your e-certificate of participation. We also encourage you to subscribe and watch on our official Vibal Facebook and YouTube channel. Muli, Maraming salamat at magandang araw sa ating lahat.